Let's start. Welcome to our next uh, Java user group event. Today with Jarek, he will tell us something about Spring, Jakarta, CDI, the good parts. And let's see how much ranting is still left <laughs> in this uh, presentation. I'm very interested. Uh, but before some information, you have uh, seen the sponsor slides in the waiting room. And uh, big thanks to all our sponsors, which uh, who make it uh, possible to have all these events here. And uh, you can see a chat. On, usually, it's on the right side of your screen. There you can chat with all the attendees together and uh, so on. If you have a question for Jarek later while we have the presentation, you can switch the tab to the Q&A. And please answer questions for Jarek in the Q&A tab. And I will collect the questions and uh, ask them to uh, Jarek. In this stream, we have a small delay of about uh, 10 to 15 seconds. This is because our server optimizes the stream, so you have the best uh, possible uh, quality on your device. So if you uh, ask a question or answer something, please keep in mind that there's a small delay of 10 to 15 seconds. After the presentation, uh, when the webinar ends, you will be forwarded, redirected to the Java user group website to a feedback form. Please fill out the feedback. It's uh, uh, very important for us to get your feedback. And uh, we will forward the feedback, of course, to Jarek. And uh, after you have filled out the feedback form, you can leave your email address in a second form. It's not connected to the feedback form. And if you leave your email address there, you can win an IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate license. So please use this. We make a raffle once a month uh, with uh, everyone who entered his uh, email address after filling out the feedback form. Um, we have a Slack channel. Some of you know it already. And uh, I sent the link here in the chat so everyone knows it. Uh, and please use the Slack channel to connect to other Java developers, ask questions. Uh, and of course, you can connect there to us, to the Java user group, to Ursula, and uh, yeah, to everyone. And this uh, webinar will be recorded. And we will make it uh, public, hopefully, if everything works, in a few days on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel for this. So I sent you the link to our YouTube channel in the chat to and please subscribe us on YouTube and uh, that would be really great. Yeah, so that's it. Please enjoy the talk with Jarek, ask questions, and let's have a nice evening. So Jarek, it's your turn now. Okay, so hello everyone. It's nice that you are here to listen to my talk. Uh, I will share a screen in a few seconds, but let me introduce myself while I'm still on a big screen. So I am Jarek Ratajski, uh, and I am software developer, basically. For uh, I call myself sometimes wizard, but it's mostly because uh, I like uh, making you know magic things that do not work working. So things that were not moving, moving. Sometimes, actually, this is more necromancy, you know, old programs that uh, barely work. I actually enjoy making them live again. Uh, and I call myself, uh, in fact, I'll of officially, that's my job title, an architect, because uh, like 10 years ago, I was senior developer architect, but I'm now older, so I'm now old developer an architect. I work for Ingenious here in Switzerland, a small company. Uh, and we work for banks and various customer uh, customers, mostly associated with financial area. Uh, yeah, that's it. So my talk for today is uh, uh, is uh, is about Spring Jakarta, the good parts. I will explain a little bit uh, 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 what what does it mean. Just a moment, because I'm not sure that I really shared screen. Uh, I think I am sharing right now screen. Please. Uh, yes, would... the screen is shared. Everything perfect. Okay, so I'm sharing screen and that's it. So about me, it was already there. By the way, if you are interested in uh, like uh, 
uh, challenges we are hiring good developers so uh, about me more uh, and about this talk i work with java e more or less since 2001 so i started with doing some java in 1999 uh, slowly switching from C++, but then it was mostly experiment. And yeah, and, but since 20, 2001, I am a full-time Java developer. Uh, but I was programming like even uh, in 1991, um, but it was Commodore 64 and stuff like that. So it's a long story till now, like 19 years with Java E. Uh, and with Spring, I haven't really used Spring 1 point something, but I do remember Spring point 2 maybe some interesting uh, annotations to that. I remember when some, there was an application server called EJBOOSS. And this is, uh, in fact, uh, just a, a fact. This is the first version of JBoss and Sun Microsystems at that time uh, forbidden flowers or lawyers forbidden the author of EJBOSS to name it this way because OJB is like a, marketing name for of the property of, of Sun, so he had to change the name to JBoss. That's how we have it now. And I still remember, and you still probably sometimes find, find those huge XMLs in Spring, and but, but back then that was a, a writing code in XML, as I call it, uh, configuring it. It was actually called, the how to say that, separating uh, logic from the configuration and it was considered a good thing. So I really remember all those books and I remember all those systems when I was actually for a few years more XML developer than Java developer. Okay. And even now, uh, I am still working a little bit with Spring and Java E. Some of them are, uh, I'm constantly touching a couple of projects. So mostly in the maintenance, a little bit of Upgrade, so I'm still with this story. Uh, not very, very, uh, I'm actively developing applications, most of which are not really Spring and Java -E related right now, and uh, mostly not even in Java, but in Kotlin, which is close to Java, but there is some shift. Uh, but still on production, uh, I have also like a couple of pro products, uh, older projects, some, sometimes and mostly not from me, which, which I'm just, uh, maintaining. Okay. And yeah, as I said, I have only actually only few projects when it comes to how many uh, I did in my life, let's say productive, which are not really just Spring or Java E based. So this is still, let's say for me, a short story. Uh, however, I have even quite, quite critical application in that area, uh, net based, which let's say are the most important applications in the company and stuff like that. So this is, this is in fact, uh, in some areas very critical. Uh, okay, my perspective, and I will for sometimes explain why this talk and why it's a little bit strange and why maybe title is misleading, but let me, let me uh, explain myself. I have a little bit different perspective uh, because I do like solving production bugs. Like, you know, all this concurrency issues, security performance, Heisenbugs. I'm not sure, not everyone have heard this, but you know, this is the bug that uh, very crazy that manifests itself twice in a year on production and never if you debug stuff because it can only happen on the real system or, you know, memory leaks, some resource leaks. And if I see such, such thing, it's for me like, Oh, I need to know what's happened. Uh, I am the guy that jumps into it happily and I want to uh, see what caused the problem, what was the bug behind and how to avoid that in the future. Uh, especially if this is not in my code. So I actually like browsing code when I see such problems and I, it happens that for instance, performance problems in my code, I also happily solve them, but it's no, not that much uh, uh, fun anymore <laughs> because I know that I was the bad guy that caused the problem at the first place. Okay. Partially this talk is inspired by this book. So like, I don't know, 10 years ago or a little bit more, I read this clean uh, code book. And sometimes later, actually not the book, but I've seen a video, uh, one of the first videos of clean architecture by, by Uncle Bob, Professor Martin. And I still remember this 
this uh, this moment when uh, during the talk he's saying that something strange happened with our world that we are first uh, we are first even before knowing what we are actually developing we already know that we will use java e or spring or juice or some other platform and we have not yet asked the customer what has to be done so and for me it was like i was that developer in 2010 i think i was that that guy that like if there something comes to me i will and i don't i do i don't really even uh, ask what has to be done but if it's java then it must be like spring or java e yeah, i consider both of them quite similar let's say we'll talk about this later but that was me and i was for me that was like a punch in the face what are you talking uncle bob why it's wrong what's wrong with that approach because you know i learned the platform i know how it works so now i want to use it also about perspective when i was young and even before java my biggest important part of what what i wanted to achieve was kind of productivity i wanted fast delivers actually I wasn't really, you know, in 1995, I wasn't really working professionally, even if I earned some money, it was, you know, more for fun. But for me it was, if I can do something that works in a less line of codes, then that's what I'm following. That's how I became uh, really uh, falling in love in C++. You could do magic in code, in few lines of code, and then it worked. Then even Java, even though this was a little bit different, story why but it was also productive for instance making GUI in swing etc so this was I was looking for this productivity but then I started to work professionally and I see other kind of problems that for instance if I am working longer on some piece of code I'm working with a team bad things happen to our code the bugs that seem to be stupid that no one would do actually are happening in the code and I started to more switching, and that's, I think, normal, to, OK, delivering something in a few lines of code is cool, but how to deliver something that will be working well and stable for months? And I'm not talking about uh, just you know putting something on production. I'm talking about active development, that you put a piece of code that someone two weeks ago, or two weeks later, will change, will add some feature. And your original constraints, your ideas, what, what you wanted there, will not explode because someone added somewhere uh, another piece of code. So basically, I was uh, looking for solutions which do not bring many pitfalls. Like, you know, you have to be careful about something. Don't do this and keep that in mind. And so avoid such things. So I was, uh, I wanted to look for solutions which will bring me safe refactoring that's actually the big, biggest problem a lot of the stuff we do is uh, actually easy to break when you do refactoring to the point that people are afraid of refactoring uh, that's kind of normal we accept that that we don't do refactoring because it might break stuff like in many companies this is like default approach don't touch running code uh, things must be easy to test so easy to check that they are valid and those tests must be trustful, meaningful. I want to, you know, if I write test, I, I must be kind of sure that it's actually really testing what it's written there. Uh, I will go to this point later. And this is also important. And when it, when I, this is, uh, that was a very hard lesson I still remember. You bring a new, someone new to the team and mostly there is never enough time to teach someone, to tell new people about all the, crazy stuff, crazy rules that you have uh, in your code that you never put call this method, blah, blah, or something like that, because, yeah, because there is never enough time. Even if you are working in a relatively peaceful environment, yeah, the, the development times is mostly something we don't have uh, in abundance. We, we have always a little bit limited, yeah. We, so that's, uh, sorry for, in Java, this safety uh, is actually created by two things, type system and tests. Type system shows me what kind of uh, types I have. That's why, for instance, I had, I'm not in love in PHP or in JavaScript, because like dynamic type system, it reduces this type safety. I don't have to explain that to Java user group. And of course, tests also bring 
brings bring some uh, safety. Yeah, let's say it. I'm not talking about security in terms of you know hacking or whatever. Uh, this is like safety of safety of code. Uh, I bet there is a better name for that, but I forgot. So I will show you a typical pitfall. What I'm talking about. I still remember when we had IPIs like this. There is a connection, and then you have a method read, which actually you read something from connection, but there is a method in it, you have to initialize that. Back then in 90s, when you were using C or C++, that was kind of a normal approach. Remember, and there was documentation, remember to always init it before calling read. Is it a good mm, way of actually putting API? Um, hope most of you know this is actually uh, how to call the way how we not do that, because of course it's easy to put warnings into the documentation who has Java docs, but no one really reads Java docs. And it's easy even if someone reads a Java doc or reads, uh, sees, sees a problem, sooner or later it will be forgotten. And think about, you know, you have like now typical Java developer uses hundreds of libraries. Um, yeah, and Think that in each of them, there is a kind of this pitfall. You have to remember something. You won't remember that, especially like you have eight developers working in eight hours like for a longer time. It just doesn't work. So sooner or later, someone will do a refactoring and this init method will be gone because there is nothing that compiler will prevent us because yeah, it's just, you know, uh, this is the way it is. Uh, nothing prevents us from writing the, this method in a way that only read is there, because that's how we want to maybe read the value and deliver it to the user. Okay, so uh, there is there are two ways to prevent that apart from documentation. Maybe write a test. Okay, that's a cool, uh, maybe put a, 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 of the method, that's a good way, but maybe most of you already tried this with mocks. So you know that mocks always are create a green test. So I am not once I've seen such kind of method tested with 100% coverage, but exactly after refactoring, something was gone and the tests were green. So the better method for that is to use type system and create something like init returns initialized connection. And only this initialized connection type has method read. So you can never ever forget. Yeah, there are multiple ways, but that's what I'm talking to you uh, when I think about using type system, which is for me, like this is this is the way how I would may want the programs to be, uh, how I would want to use the type system to introduce safety, to introduce constraints in IAM code that I want the future users of this code, the other developers to follow. The problem is that the leading platforms for uh, that we have in Java introduced, in fact, a lot of such small pitfalls. And uh, so small rules you have to remember, I will show them to you. And not only that, but they also uh, do some, I would say, uh, nasty effects in the coding architecture. So the code touched with a spring later hmm, may become a mess. I will explain that. So, maybe one more. This talk was called the good parts and I am already getting into rant. Yes, sorry for that. Whenever I starting to, uh, I, I had really a lot of experience with Spring even now, and it's hard for me to, <laughs> to not get into running, really, to getting really like mad sometimes even, passionate. Maybe it's because it's easier for me to be, to you know, to hate something with passion than to love something uh, with such a passion, <laughs> but, I called this talk a good part just to remind myself that I also try and I will try to find the good parts and uh, later will be delivered to you, I'll promise. So it's so, but before you get into good, part, into good parts, you have to know what's wrong, what I think is wrong and why I think it's wrong. So this is about the harming code and but how to avoid that and what are the alternatives, okay. If I was doing this talk 10 years ago, I am sure my answer to all the problems with Spring and Java E as I present them, as I will present to you, will be read more books. You have to read more books because yeah, it's you haven't read enough. 
But this is a plenty of books you have to actually read. This is, by the way, that's not my uh, that's not my shell bookshelf, but I still have somewhere at home a lot of EJB and Spring books. So the first thing that I really think it, that is quite actually common to both Spring, uh, Java E, and uh, CDI is actually like the the core concept of CDI or beans. And the thing is, what is a bean? Uh, so, uh, because I'm not talking about Java beans. I hope uh, that's actually a good question to you. Uh, I, I don't expect now answer, but have you recently written getters and setters somewhere? Especially that you had to write getters and setters, you didn't want to. Because like, hope, I hope this topic is kind of closed. We are not writing as many getters and setters and in the past in a Java environment. I think that was a really crazy idea. Uh, so that, uh, but actually, uh, you can write if you don't think so. Um, but let's say the, this is not the topic of uh, today's talk. I'm talking about this Java E beans, EJBs, CDI beans, JSF beans, JPA uh, entities, which are also kind of beans. But mostly, let's say uh, I will be now mostly addressing Spring for the next, let's say, half of hour uh, or twenty minutes. I don't know how we'll let's see how it works, but. Uh, what I say will be more or less the same for Java E. Only at the end, I will uh, talk a little bit specifically about Java E and a little bit specifically about Spring. I will tell you. So the Spring, the beans, uh, they look like a classes. You just put a class in Java, but there are some subtle di subtle differences. Uh, uh, yeah, I call it in a really bad words because I hate. It looks like a normal object. But it doesn't behave because it has some magic attached. This magic prevents you from using new. If you have a bean, like a spring bean, if you instantiate it by new, it will not work correctly. Although for some time it might look like it's working, but it will sooner or later fail. That's, by the way, that's a pitfall. It's because you can do that. You can instantiate by new, but it will be not real object. And it can even be worse. It might have a constructor, but then it actually has a method post-construct, which could only be called, for instance, by Java E server, but you would know about that you have to call it. So crazy things happen. And there are special limitations, like conventions, how you use them. Like, for instance, you must remember in Spring, by default, bins are, you cannot actually store information in fields because those are shared between all threads. And actually, this will lead to disaster. So there are these rules that almost everyone knows. This is like, I think, that you uh, that you don't put uh, data in the fields of Spring Beans. This is mostly known by all the developers, but it might be forgotten. But let's say this is quite, uh, I don't really see that often this problem. Uh, I mostly see, for instance, that because uh, the other thing, because in EJBs, for instance, do not behave this way, but people that have Spring experience assume that they work this way. And <laughs> they uh, they also treat them as singletons, which are, but they are not. That, let's say this is a minor problem. The question is, why do we even have beans at the first place? Yeah. And the I no answers for you because you want to inject stuff. We want to inject everything everywhere. Yeah. Uh, because we've learned that there is something called dependency injection. And obviously, it is good because it is a design pattern. Uh, yes. And if we go to the Wikipedia, uh, there is a definition what the dependency injection is. Uh, and I will spare you reading that. It's actually bigger text, so you can check it. But the most important part of that is like the, the, the core of dependency injection is passing the service to the client rather than allowing a client to build or find the service. That is the fundamental requirement. Of so it's just that the client doesn't build like a service for itself. It gets it. That's the, the core of dependency injection. And maybe to illustrate it more, uh, this is, I think, basic stuff for all the Java developers, but let's and do it once again. So if we have here a class my service, which has some database repository, and it constructs it in a constructor, 
we don't have dependency injection here. That what we here have is exactly anti-dependency injection. We have like in we have a dependency, uh, let's say on a service which depends, which is a client of the of DB repository. And yeah, that might be a problem. I don't say it's always wrong, but mostly it causes a problem when you, for instance, want to test this with memory database. So that's why maybe you want to rewrite it in a way that my service has a constructor which accepts db repository and then it has some other methods this is of course like simplified code i even see that i've forgotten about the new keyword here but uh, then you have some method of construction which creates db repository and then passes it passes it to uh, to the mm, sorry to the uh, my service. That's actually, believe me, <laughs> that's actually how dependency injection is supposed to work. You don't see here any spring, and you don't need any spring, any Java EE or CDI. And Uncle Bob, sorry for referring to him for so many times, uh, in fact, put this a uh, long time ago in one of the blog posts that, yeah, it's dependency injection doesn't require framework. That's normal. It's just the dependency injection uh, feature uh, that we have in Java is constructor. And as I say, it's actually was supported since Java 1.0. We had the constructors. By the way, in functional languages, we have additional stuff that does dependency injection for us, but that's not what... Uh, this talk is about. The point is, so why do we even use uh, frameworks for that? Uh, let's call it inversion of control containers, like dependency injection containers. I will use both words. So again, it's both for Spring and Java. It's valid what I will say. Because if you pass a lot of these objects, maybe you'll be bored and you will find that this is a tedious job, passing all these dependencies, if you have many layers. Okay. Yeah, we pass the DB repository to the service, which it passes it to some other service, which we passes it to repository. You have like, uh, you are building kind of a tree of, and you are, it takes a little bit of time to construct this dependency graph if you do it without a container. So, so container lets you solve problem fast. But that's how I see that. It's like, actually, yes, you will solve it, solve it fast, but what you create is kind of a technical bet. You do it now, you pay for that later. Why I say so? Because this is a very similar story with a go-to keyword. Uh, now, it's like, especially in, among Java developers, of course, we don't have go-to in Java. It's receive keyword, but it's not supported. We never jump in the code, but even at C sharp, C, you will see go to care keyword. I've forgotten where it's actually supported in C. I wasn't using it, so I'm not really sure. But and some developers even now claim that if you use go to, you can create smarter algorithms and sometimes save yourself a few pieces of code. Actually, the extra who was against go to argued about it, and there are many con, uh, let's say, uh, you can show that it's probably not really true. Uh, you can always, uh, you can mostly s write smarter code and avoid go to. But this is the story. And I, if we have injections, this is very similar on other level. No, you can, you don't jump to any place you wish with go to. You inject anything from any layer anywhere you want. So that's how I see architecture of. Uh, Spring Java E application may look like after a while. Like, because it's easy to inject anywhere, people do that. And so they, for instance, mostly, most of you, if working with uh, Spring, like standard approach, you will not see that uh, it is an anti pattern, anti pattern to put a repository directly in controller. But you can do that, and there is nothing that can prevent you easily from doing that. HTTP or uh, checking HTTP request in persistence layer, you can do that. It's easy, and people do that. So basically, you inject everything, and you get like your system becomes polluted with this uh, problem that anything can be injected anywhere. By the way, uh, 
Spring means also this is funny. They are singletons, and we are right now. Most of the developers will say singletons are bad, but for some reasons, if those singletons are spring means, then they are actually cool. And by the way, this is not totally unjustified because they are like better singletons. But come on, they are still singletons. Yeah. And the answer when I am and I was complaining for that and all the other stuff is only bad developers don't do that. Or do that. Only bad developers will create this mess. It's exactly the argument that was used in the past by the go-to proponents, that the wise, reasonable developers will always use go-to in a sensible way. And only, you know, if you are bad developers, there is anyhow no hope for you. But if you are bad developers, so just let don't touch the go-to. It's a good stuff for a good people. Yeah. And that's that's the same problem here, actually. See, yes. <laughs> Yeah, only bad developers will do that. But somehow, uh, when I get to the real systems from production, I already see this mess. I will address this a uh, few slides later, how bad this mess is. So, and I know the answer because, you know, uh, in our environment, we have this great scrum or other methodologies and there is a moment, an hour before demo, when things do not fully work and someone realizes, yeah, I have to inject this thing here. What's better way? Just, yeah, put this annotation and it will be there, even if it is like injecting HTTP requests into, I don't know, database repository, why not? And then, oh, typically it's more sophisticated and that's not always obviously instantly wrong, but yeah, you just add one another annotation. And you see that it looks maybe bad, but you do that because it's easy. And you know, the most important things in Agile are, you know, velocity and nice burn down charts. And we don't know want to make them look bad. So we do that. We put that into the demo and the code stays like that forever. Uh, here I even have some kind of a metric, like you can do it on your own. I'm also interested with some because I asked a few times already, please give me these measurements. Uh, maybe you know your code. What is the worst class in your code base? Like if you count all the auto wires or inject, or you know, the, if you only use uh, constructor based injection without auto wire, just how many dependencies you have in the worst class in your worst, I mean, in the maximum in your code base. And uh, I don't know how this officially, this metrics is called. I have some bad names for that. Uh, but let's say official name, uh, not that bad, is levels of level of beans obscurity. It's the same for NACDI, JB, whatever. Uh, how many uh, you have? And I can tell you that in a projects that basically look okay, they look like people really cared about good code. If those are uh, those projects are heavily Java E or Spring affected, I mean they are like done with these platforms. Typical number is like fifteen to twenty, eighteen. Like, like this is, a, let's say, very exact project I have in mind right now. So think of them for a moment. I have a class that has 18 dependencies. Mm, I think it's a little bit too much. Probably this class uh, is really hard to maintain. It should be actually three or four classes. The problem is the moment you wanted to split this class is already gone. And now it's very hard to split it because you have to touch a lot of code. So I even uh, seen this as a um, argument for containers. By the way, this will also be addressed because other people have seen that, that if, if you have such classes, yeah, if you don't have a container uh, manually working with such a code, if I have 18 uh, dependencies, now I want to set up this object, that would be a hell in colleague constructor. Yes, it would be, but that's actually because the harm was already done. So the solution, uh, and that's funny because this is kind of solution partially supported by Spring people. So if you have this auto wire, this is a small example. We have three classes, uh, three dependencies in a class. Switch always to constructor ba uh, based dependency injection. If you didn't do it by now, I tell you, trust me, people associated with Spring for a long time tell you to do that. Like Oliver Gilke, look at the year, 2013. And he's already showing that if you do field-based injection, this is like asking, begging for null pointer exception. Check that if you haven't seen that. But I, I think this is now 
quite of accepted. It's uh, uh, it's nothing really special. But then you know. Uh, next step, you can actually still being in a spring even remove this auto wired, but still the spring will construct this bin. It's possible, but then there is a next step. You just leave the class A like as it is, and then have some class maybe like services configuration when you have this, uh, when I actually call this new. And by the way, if you look at the spring services configuration, it typically looks like a configuration of bins in your spring project. It's not that different. You just don't have annotations there. You have a little bit more of usage of new. But it's not such as a big step to get rid of Spring if you just want to use dependency injection. Or the same for like, OK, uh, with Java, it's a little bit, uh, OK, I would say the same. I will get to later to other problem. But so and by the way, if you if you think, OK, that means a lot of repeating new, 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 etc. You can there are ways and I will not talk right now waste time, but you can actually extract these two methods, make a bigger hierarchy of classes, etc. But I don't really repeat. I am programming like this for a few years. I don't really feel like I'm repeating a lot of code. Actually, I would say my code, if I don't use Spring compared with Spring, I would say mostly I have some overhead, but this is I would less than 5% or even, I don't know, 3%. It's hard to say. On a smaller code, it's probably more. But on a bigger code base, it might be even that I am winning. It's hard to say. I never did the same system uh, twice in a, exactly the same in a Spring and without Spring. Although I did some uh, refactorings from Spring to no Spring. Yeah? But it's, again, mostly this refactoring was uh, with some additional features. So it's, again, not totally easy to compare. The point here is that. If you have a class with five dependencies, you add six, you already have this bigger cons constructor, then you see, mm, probably I have to split it. And that's a good moment to split it, because this class, class is still small to split it into two. You can still manage it. But if it's, yeah, it's a little mess like 12, because it was easy to create that, then it's hard, yeah? By the way, it's even better, because lo after that, I realized that I mean, in fact, using dependency injection as a as a pattern, even without Spring, too often. I sometimes make things configurable which doesn't have to be configurable because there is always one implementation and exactly one. So why even bother? And I still, for instance, can test it. Yeah, this is, of course, the stability is a big, big thing. So this is how, for instance, uh, I'm mostly recently developing in Kotlin, and that's how my let's say something called module look like in Kotlin. I'm even using something like lazy, which uh, let's say is a way, uh, by the way, this is the way to write it compatible with Java, that makes me easy that I uh, that if some services depend on each other, I don't worry about the order in which they are defined, because this will be solved uh, during the start of application. So uh, I don't have, for instance, to worry that, OK, I have to first define the repository, then the service, etc., because this is uh, using lazy uh, class, it's easy. So there is some difference when you do manual dependency injection and container-based. I would say that with a container-based, uh, you uh, have no problems for months. You just inject, 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 and then you have a big disaster. And it's really hard to get out of it. In a manual dependency injection, on the other hand, you have a, soon a pain. that You have to solve almost every day and whenever you add something uh, like a new class, but you feel this pain. This is still small and manageable to to, and you can fix the code like split the classes. I split a lot of lot of times refactor splitting classes into smaller so that I have like my ideal number is like three dependencies for classes. But in reality, when I'm in hurry, I have like five or six sometimes. Yeah, but never eighteen. Never get into the mess. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I won't say that manual <laughs> dependency injection solves all the problem. It still will. You will have mess in any productive project anyway. But this mess will be a little bit better shaped, I would say. And by the way, there are beans that I hate more than singletons. So request code beans, uh, anything that basically depends on treat local or some, some kind of crazy uh, life cycle. 
because those are in, even worse than global variables. For instance, this is a story from a real project. I had a method one, let's say this, is, this was obviously a different name with two arguments. Then I call uh, inside method two with just passing argument A, then method three argument B. And one day a business comes and says, oh, because method two was doing some printing, we don't need it anymore. Please remove it. Don't make this call. So what I did, I removed obviously this method. I even removed the argument. We don't need A to be passed here. And it even passed the test because there were, those are on mocks and then it failed on production miserably. Uh, maybe on tests, but you know, though late tests integrated tests done by the manual testers. So it was a shame. What happened? <laughs> because if you have this request scoped bins, sooner or later someone will use them as a method to pass arguments hidden in the back. Like, you know, it's like, because I can in this method too, I can, uh, I can actually, what can I do? I can, I can set it in some, in some bin and then it will be stored in some request scope bin and then method three will actually read it. How to even find that? So it's like passing without using in, uh, of arguments. This is a horrible thing. And believe me, people are doing that, especially for instance, in a spring batch, which is a cool thing. Spring batch is a really like productive thing. And uh, there are not many alternatives. And that's just uh, how by default people do that. They pass arguments, not in the payload, but in behind in the backs and somewhere hidden way, so, which makes reasoning how we get this value here very, very tough. And it's very uh, tricky to not fail during refactoring. Okay, this is basically breaks something called local reasoning. So how much, how big piece of code do I have to look at when I'm thinking what's going on here? In such projects which use this kind of spins, especially this is like you even have to get through like almost whole the system. Okay, it's not that bad, but it will become that bad later in this talk. Okay, so the outcome is, many small and potentially reasonable changes that you would say, oh, that's how I would want to do it. Uh, and that looks okay, that goes through the review, may in fact break your system. And, and because I know how it works, you are using Mokito, you are using EasyMock, all other stuff, you are testing mocks, all your tests are mostly green, and this works on tests, yeah. So I say, Please hold your beans and think about not using dependency injection and try to. It's actually, and I will later tell you how to do that. I already sh shown you a few steps that you can do. Uh, maybe not Oreo code base, but try to think about small modules. By the way, there are more talks about it. For instance, I really like the talk Slaying Sacred Cows by Tomar Gable, which one hour attacks only this one particular problem. And he even says exactly that point if you are seeing benefits of IOC, like of this, uh, because maybe you exactly have this 18 uh, beans, then it means your code is already out of control. Okay, but there is other thing. We don't only have beans, we have uh, aspects. And actually, uh, aspects, sometimes we actually have beans because we want aspects to work on them. And there's my favorite aspect that I really love with passion, transactional. Because I've seen, I don't know how many ways why it, when it failed, uh, even though from the code, it wasn't directly simply visible. For instance, you know, probably that when you know, use transactional to control annotation to control your transactions in, by the way, this is again, same for Spring, same from Java E, it would, they won't work on private methods, basically, normally. Okay, who would do that? I can tell you who would do that. Maybe someone had a public method and then there was some refactoring and it became private because now we jump to other methods and this method that officially was before was public now became private and was now it's hidden. This happens. This is not safe during refactoring. That's even worse because method might be public but you're doing some, something called self-call. This is actually the problem of dynamic pro procs and ask yourself, you know what I mean, that if you call from one method, method of the same bin, the annotations normally, by the way, it's interesting when 
uh, they will work, but normally they won't work. This is a crazy thing. Again, you do some refactoring, you move methods between bins. Seems that the same code is called, but now works differently because maybe you now don't have database transactions. Everything, for instance, either nothing is committed or everything is always auto committed. So you have exceptions. This means you have partially stored objects in inconsistent state. Great. Okay, that might happen. Worse. Okay, this is again seems like a stupid idea, but you always can call uh, objects and instantiate with them with new. And maybe it happens. You, someone will not see that this is actually a service and needs to be constructed by container like by Java or Spring. This is not that often, but still it happens because you have a constructor. Why not? It might be. So this is now more funny because now it very depends on the platform. But basically, you know that transactional by default will not work in multi-threaded environment in a way that if you have uh, if you have multiple uh, threads on the same transaction and uh, basically you are jumping with a code between threads like you use parallel stream or you use fork join, then it will fail because it's mostly typically associated with some thread local context. So that's already a problem because uh, we now have 16, 30 cores and we cannot use them freely because you know, our frameworks prevent us from that. Uh, this is something I fear thought it's like, <laughs> it will never happen. That's obviously a bad joke. I call it transactional. Think that someone defined his own transactional, maybe under the different name that does some other stuff, but makes transactional not really working. And even this can be even automatically attached to any method. Doesn't have to be explicitly attached to the method. There are many ways to define aspects. <laughs> but uh, last year, I even had this funny story when there was exactly an application where transactional behaved crazy. And I after a while, I realized this is not transactional from a standard Spring package. This is a, a company written transactional. Someone had a lot of fun. So I called it transactional because it's actually it had a bug. It didn't work properly. It was funny, but by the way, it was a little bit of time wasted till I realized this is not the transactional I am I'm looking for. Yeah. So and that's the, the last one was the most uh, crazy story that happened to me. Uh, I realized that one of the application at uh, a very serious customer was working more than a year on auto commit. So it means when there was an exception, everything was always committed because there was one small jar missing in the server. I, I can tell you exact details, but I don't want to put it now. Let's say a, a little bit complex, but not that complex, but such things happen. And by the way, on tests, everything was fine. So I only accidentally have seen it because I wanted to stress test some productive machine. I've seen uh, really crazy, crazy problems. Yeah. So and think that. And by the way, there are many ways, other ways to break transactional. Uh, those are, let's say, my favorite ones. Uh, but think that this is already complex. And now we put JPA on top of that. Just another kind of beans, like we call them entities, but they are kind of a magic beans as well. And they have like this managed detached state. I really think this is something broken here because if we have some method like you, I have user, get me groups, get products, like method on user. Now you know this uninitialized collection problem of hibernate, whatever. If object is a man is associated to session, we can call it. Otherwise, we can't and we will mostly fail on but maybe someone before it initializes it. This is really crazy because this again breaks local reasoning. I look at a piece of code. I have a class. This class has a method. Hmm. I should be able to call it. But no, in order to be sure that my call will work, I have to go through all the code. What was happening from the beginning with this user object? Maybe it was going to some other from one repo. Then it was associated again with some other repository again, blah, blah, blah. Crazy things actually happen. And then you know after that that you might actually safely call it. But then someone changes two line in, in your code and it breaks. Then you have dirty checking and the proxy problems. I don't want to get into details. So JPA is really horrible in terms of local reasoning. 
So if we combine these two things together, transactional with JPA, it's already a little bit of problematic when you have a problem. And now add to that transaction isolation level issues. So again, this is something most of the developers, to my uh, uh, surprise, do not know. So once again, if you haven't heard it, if you read about AC transaction, I is mostly, but not always a lie. It means that transactions are not really isolated and there are subtle effects because of that. And sometimes real bugs. This is this has nothing to do with, SQ, with Java E, absolutely nothing to do with Spring. This is SQL database specific thing, transaction handling actually associated with performance. But it is very subtle if something happened to find the problem. And now if you put onto that JPA with this managed detached object states, and if you put onto that transactional, which might have some quirks, this creates a mess, especially. So I actually in my life spent weeks analyzing why, for instance, here in a database was written null or why something wasn't written into database, even in, in the logs we see that it should have been. Because all that together creates, sometimes I feel, I feel like in order to, re, to, to uh, find out the problem, I have to go through all the cold ways, like everything that is deployed on the server, yeah? And by the way, this is one of the most crazy problems. If something doesn't work with transactional, where do you put the breakpoint? Because this is nothing typically associated with your code. So maybe even in your code is a problem because you did something wrong, wrong from a spring way. But in order to see that, you have to go through all this layer of spring. And for instance, in case of this missing jar, the problem was only visible during the initialization phase of the spring context. Never later, not anymore. So you know you have to put a debug on a Spring initialization context to see that you misconfigure the server in terms of which jars you use. Not that funny. Okay, and all aspects have exactly similar problems. I put transactional as a typical example because uh, this is something almost every Java developer has seen in his life. So, but think about security, like rows allowed. Think about it that you might have in your code security annotation that prevents some unauthorized uh, use of method by some people that don't have a privilege, but there is like self-call problem. So this is actually not checked. Was checked before, but not now, not anymore. And no one realized that during the review. Is it really a great thing to have on production? Yeah. Uh, so uh, when I talk to people, they say that I'm exaggerating sometimes. They don't see that many problems. And last two years, I get idea why it's so. Uh, because I really looked at those people that, let's say, are overusing beans. I worked with some. And I see how it works. You have the problem. Something doesn't work. So the solution is you, you, know, you use Stack Overflow, you do random changes, and then it magically works. Don't ask. I've seen. Let's say I see that sometimes in the history of a uh, Git or SVN, uh, that it's exactly what developer did. It's even worse. But finally, it worked. And most of the developers, because they have a lot of work, they are really doing useful stuff that's really needed by business. They just go forward. OK, it worked. Put it, commit it, release it. Let's go. It will work for some time. But they don't understand what was the reason. Typically, there was no magic, actually. There was a really good reason but they will never know that. And by the way, a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, to the problems I actually mentioned, there are tons of additional annotations you can use to fix some of the problems. Uh, by the way, notice my favorite one. There is a notation in Spring which is called no repository bin. It fixes one of the funny problems, but you think of it. You have to mark your object. This is not a repository, how cool, yeah? So, uh, if you do bin, so this for me led me to the to the uh, some realization that maybe this thing is not that easy actually as people think. You have to read a lot, understand how it works to use it safely. Maybe too much. By the way, it's also the same thing. I started to ask whenever I've seen this annotation doesn't really make sense for me. So I was getting some, if I was able asking developers why it's there. By the way, this pie chart is totally you know. 
that's uh, there were no numbers. I really only talked to a few developers, so don't mm, take numbers seriously. But it's how it looks from my perspective. Like mostly, you know, that was it was working in some other piece of code. So I just copied all these five annotations and I, now like here, and they are still working. That must be good. Yeah. So and the other thing, like I've really seen people adding randomly annotations one by one, maybe guided by Stack Overflow to the point it worked. And then they had such classes with such a big or methods with a lot of annotations. Most of them had absolutely no sense at all. But the prop one of them maybe or maybe accidentally the problem was solved. And nowadays, rarely anyone reads a books really and tries to understand. And uh, in the past, I was thinking that Developers are guilty, but right now I slowly see that hmm, the environments where just people can rely on the type system and they don't have to read and keep in mind so many things. But because we slowly accept that this is all magic, and we have a magic in code, and it just we'll put these annotations and will work. So by the way, uh, magic I use this term, and uh, people from uh, functional programming use this when they are thinking talking bad about java and all that stuff uh, it's not actually things we do not understand that's let's say popular uh, idea what is magic things we don't know how it works but magically works but uh, let's say this definition i really like things that do not compose safely you might know how it works you maybe you might know with the details but you have to analyze a lot of stuff to actually find out if it would work or not so, okay, let's forget about this John the Gold. Uh, I will show you one example, one of my lovely examples. And that's based on a real story, but not exactly those annotations. But retriable, there is such annotation in one of the Spring models, not really often used, but there is. And it's easy to understand what it does. If the method fails with exception, it retries it automatically. You can even configure that it will retry like three times. By default, I have forgotten if there is like unlimited or 10, something like this. There is a default for that. And it works, really. And there is another annotation you know, transactional. Mostly works. Uh, there is no public keyword here, so it might not work, but suppose that's not the problem. And then we put them both together, transactional and retriable. Think what happens if there is a, and how many of you know the answer? If there is exception, will a retry be made inside the transaction? And after that, will, there will be commit? Or there will be three times started with begin and committed transaction. For instance, if there are exceptions. Do you know the answer? And if you don't, how much time it takes to find out the answer? And I can tell you, it takes a lot of time and a lot of digging through documentation and actually, Finally, you will just debug in on a server and see, hmm, this is probably how it should work, but I am not perfectly sure that it will work, always work like that. This is really crazy thing, but of course this is an edge case. So such things we don't happen off, don't have often, but think cache and security. If you have security and cache annotations, then you have sometimes them. Don't you cache something that was seen by admin and then normal user sees that? Are you sure? Okay, I can tell you that most of this is done clever way, but are you sure? Okay, so there is a hidden cost of being aspect magic. We have strange problems on production. I've seen post development. It means the whole team cannot work because the server does crazy things like data is deleted and strange things happen. We have unrealistic tests because we test without aspect. That was for many years actually promoted by a Spring team. Just test your logic not that you know this transactional great, but then you never know that actually transactional doesn't work. But on the contrary, if you want to test with all the aspects, the tests are very slow. Uh, the other thing is like, uh, we use a lot of mocks, if we have dependency injections and all that stuff, then it uh, leads to something called over mocking. All uh, I'm really using nasty word mocks turbation for that. Uh, like you really test our testing mocks. Then there is something that really happens. Fear of refactoring. So they have areas of code, we don't touch it. I really don't like it, but that's reality, yeah? So uh, 
Uh, and then we have class path, class loader disasters sometimes, so nothing starts, but that's mostly associated with application servers. I will refer to that. And then spring new Java versions. So how many of you are stuck, yeah, I don't know, in Java 8 or 6 because you have some crazy spring module or Java E application server? Or you have ugly architecture and you know that. Uh, okay, so this is this is the thing, yeah? So the point is how we even define new aspect. Think of it. That's how, for instance, let's say I want to write my own transactional. Do it in transaction. Let's say there are better ways, but this is like standard way. Let's say doing in transaction. And then you start transaction. You do your code. This is a method code. Yeah. You see the result is an object. Uh, there is nothing like type safety here. Almost nothing like type safety. This is really nasty. By the way, this is very simplified. Don't use that uh, kind of, this is exactly how you, you do it bad way. Uh, handling transaction, I just wanted to show the idea. So I really hate how we write uh, aspect. Luckily, not many people are writing their own aspect. This really happens uh, uh, rarely. By the way, there is a, you can easily replace aspects with functions like this. You just even take almost the same code, you put supplier, do this thing in transaction, and then you call it. Now we have a little bit more of uh, type safety. Okay, not in a bytecode level, it would be even the same. By the way, this throws throwable now, it's uh, uh, not necessary. That, that That's a bug, it shouldn't be here. But you just do, it's, you see that, uh, and then you just call it with doing transaction and pass as a lambda what you wanted in transaction. This code is so much easier to reason. And by the way, these transactions would work in a private method on any scale, even in different threads. Okay, this will, okay. in different threads, that depends how you do this. In different threads, threads, actually, it would work if you defined it like that, that you have a function from transaction. Maybe here is a connection. In reality, I have like connection, which is, a, for instance, JDBI connection to and then I have this function. So this is like a lambda. And this is easy to use and sure, and uh, doesn't rely on any magic. So, and say you can do that, uh, replace aspect with lambdas with security and all other annotations, almost. No, not all of them though are uh, sensible to, to write for your own. By the way, if you are afraid, and it's good to be afraid of writing such critical stuff on your own, for instance, JOQ library and some other libraries, even Spring provides something like, let's say, transaction templates. And this is one of them. So it's already written. I have this transaction and this is my Lambda. And it's done. So you don't even write this code. Uh, and by the way, this is important. For, for months or maybe years, I was saying that everything can be and should be replaced with functions. There are some exceptions, which well, I'm not sure. When I see Spring and how great and easy diagnostic and metrics and all this other stuff works in Spring Cloud, uh, let's say Spring on Cloud, this is like, hmm, because this is not my logic. This is not the security. This is not important stuff. This is good to know about production, but it's, you know, if it doesn't work, it, nothing is really that much broken if I don't have metrics. So, and provide that in a functional way is very inefficient and unpleasant, I would say, compared to when you just have some aspect working in the background. So this is exactly the place where I see, oh, this is something on the contrary that Spring actually does well, and I cannot really replace it in something else easily on, in the same efficient way. So I would say if something is so like, uh, if we follow what's in Spl Spring Cloud Native, like there is a, this book and presentation, this is the, some of this stuff It's actually, hmm, I don't think uh, I cannot do it uh, better. I'm not talking about doing uh, REST or about doing uh, dependency injection. I'm talking about exactly this part of stuff, monitoring and so uh, diagnostic. Hmm. So, yeah. Jarek, maybe we have some time to answer a few questions. Okay. So one question is, uh, is there a known framework or library to avoid spaghetti code, uh, Lobo, <laughs> for example, uh, database stuff in service layer? With Gradle, one could create for each layer his own sub-project and don't yeah. use the dependency in a wrong way, but that feels like a lot of overhead. 
Uh, someone mentioned the Mega Plugin for Maven, and some other mentioned Arc Unit. Okay, so I already I'm already forgotten, but surely there is something uh, to track actually how you do dependencies in Sonar. There was something like that, but what you said, a uh, lot of made of Gradle modules. That's actually my approach, even if I am not using Spring. That's my uh, that's I would say for me. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say this is a really efficient, like uh, it's like nothing to be done, but uh, recently I started exactly like uh, uh, since, uh, let's say, second half of last year, I, I started to produce projects where I'm really having uh, uh, like lots of modules. So my modules in Gradle were more or less the same as before packages in uh, in Java. So like each module its own package and then I can define dependencies which is actually yes yeah, sometimes a little bit uh, uh, that's a little bit of work to uh, build this dependency tree, uh, tree in Gradle but I'm doing that and this is like for me sure way because the compiler is protecting me yeah but this is actually on a compiler level but it, I'm not sure it would I think it wouldn't help totally with spring okay it could help if I, depends if you if you have, uh, if you uh, use classes that are no like um, package with uh, interfaces, which is for everyone, I think you, you can even, even use that to Spring to achieve this kind of security. And this is, yeah, so using uh, Gradle of a lot more modules, you can, you can actually control the problem, even in Spring, I would say. Yeah, another question. Uh, as we know, Spring and others rely much on reflection and runtime bytecode generation libraries. Mm -hmm. Other frameworks like Quarkus or Micronaut are going a different way and do these things at compile time. What is your opinion, experience with them in comparison to Spring? Okay, so I don't have much uh, uh, experience with but I, either uh, Micronaut or Quarkus. I've seen them, I, I tried them. Uh, but nothing really on production. My opinion is that I do think it's better uh, the compile time magic, even if it's build time magic, is a step better than runtime magic. So it's really step forward, but but still it's not exactly that because at the end the code is not that much different. It's again the, the, from the code perspective, and that's for, for me what is important for me. The uh, the code can be again almost the same mess, yeah. But you, you will just see a lot of uh, problems earlier, but not everything. So I already remember that I've seen really runtime bugs on Quarkus, and it happens, yeah. Even if something is uh, not found, so it it can happen. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, someone said okay. Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit behind of schedule with my talk. I always uh, get a talkative, but I'll try to get fast. I still wanted to. I already told you one good thing. <laughs> I wanted to tell more, so I will go. Okay. So, but I say, whatever you think about Spring, and I will show more you where I think it's useful about Spring and Java E. Try to do stuff without beans or aspects for sometimes. Some a lot of stuff can be done. So the question is Spring useful at all? And also my answer to that, I actually even, I am presenting from sometimes something which I call Spring without Spring or uh, Spring a clean ways. It is called Spring Web Flux. And probably some of you already heard about it and uh, not everyone has tried it, especially this way I'm using that. So the Spring Web Flux is actually built in a way that you can talk, uh, use it without beans at all. A uh, typical documentation-based way will use it that with bins, but you can then do it in a total functional way. It means you have web server and all the stuff that basically you're routing, uh, binding to the port, handling of JSONs, all that framework stuff that you would expect from a web server. Uh, but your code is totally functional, uh, let's, written in a functional like Java also way without uh, magic. Here is just sample hello server, for instance, where I'm calling secure function. It means do that, but check security, etc. This is just informative. I don't want to bring real code. I have some uh, on uh, my GitHub uh, with similar approach even before Spring Web Flux. But what I really think about Spring Web is a cool web framework for non-blocking architecture. 
Uh, but supports blocking architecture. Non-blocking is really interesting if you wanna support huge loads. Uh, and it seems that it really works. So I can tell other web non-blocking servers are really great and uh, at huge uh, traffic, but seems that uh, Spring Web Flocks also. also. It is functional in a meaning that it uses functional programming lambdas, but in a nice way, the API is, for instance, better than in a alternative uh, web servers in Java like Ratpack. I, in the past, I was using something called Ratpack, which is for me the same way of thinking how to write web servers, but Spring they did better in terms of API, especially. And this is really cool. You don't need any beans. You don't need to start Spring context, really. I have such projects. Mostly not really big, but one of them actually became big. Where well, there is web flux and never, and I actually I'm using a lot of on a web layer, a lot of Spring, but the Spring context is never actually started. It's only this. So, and it's really great in testing. I really love that because if you don't start Spring context, nothing reads your class path. Nothing in creates this graph huge analyzing the classes, which is slow with reflection then it starts really fast. So for instance, I have tests like this, uh, web test client, the, here is my routing function, uh, and yeah, I'm just using that. This can be actually using dependency injection, for instance, configures to use in-memory database or some CSV files. Then this is actually a little bit long method to, but you can even extract it to construct a web uh, HTTP call. What is here important, this is, to the server, that's not actually, this is virtual server. So here is a real code, but it doesn't bind to, for instance, port 8080. It means like I can uh, concurrently run multiple of these servers on a single even JVM, not blocking the port. Maybe you know this uh, uh, port bound exception, what probably you've seen a lot of the time. So this is really a cool way to avoid that. And then you just assert the result on HTTP level. So this is a real test. For instance, I can test uh, authorization headers. This is a black box testing. So I can really test for this response, you should give me this answer. I really like this kind of test. If you're doing REST services, what is a better way to write it than writing a test like this? And it, with this, obviously, if I, you write one test, you will see that there is a lot of, uh, how to say that, tedious framework job here. By the way, maybe I'm using sometimes that here is Java but mostly I'm recently using Kotlin. So on my slides, it's a little bit of mix sometimes, but here is Java. But uh, after a while, you will have some uh, handy methods uh, designed for your framework, which will, for instance, uh, configure security and everything. And then it's really efficient. It's like a really great way of testing. And especially because this tests for real, then the difference between how it works on the production and on your test is really small. Yes, like, for instance, because the database is maybe in memory or can be even real. Uh, cool thing, if you are afraid, is that Webflux can be mixed with a classic Spring Beans. For me, it's a higher level of magic even, but it works. This is how they show that. So if you are afraid, maybe, oh, this is a total new way. Uh, I don't want to try it because then uh, there is no go back. Actually, there is easy go back. You can always, you will not waste much to just, even if you are not really satisfied with Webflux and, and then you can use normal spring, nothing wrong, wrong will happen. And so, uh, and by the way, I don't want to go into this topic, but in fact, I tested way more modules of spring, trying to use them without really spring context and beans with some luck or some uh, less luck, let's say. Uh, some templates and by the way for instance even the crazy models which are uh, on its own quite magic like spring data or jpa they also can be to some extent <laughs> used uh, without uh, really beans i'm not sure it's really that much useful it was mostly art i tried uh, just if it's possible but it was funny uh, and and actually that's what i know from spring authors that they made spring actually uh, that's not accident. They want a spring to be uh, also usable in a, let's say, not a uh, springy way, just to be like more like library of the recipes you can use, not just like framework, you have to use everything together and this composes all the uh, together. Uh, it's just uh, when I asked, it was a few, year, few years ago, uh, there was not finished job. And actually, I'm not sure the state of that. It's maybe they are now really like Spring is really in, internally free of Spring. Maybe not. It's like check on your own. This is something the only problem you won't find in official documentation. How many of Spring can you use? 
how much of Spring can you use without Spring? Okay, that was mostly uh, Webflux is about uh, Spring, but what about Java E? This is like, and uh, for me, this is a problem because well, I was even emotionally attached to Java E for some time. So I would say I really like, even I, I spent, even if I hated some application servers, I, I loved some other ones, but yeah. The, but now I say, if you still in 2020 use application server as standalone server, this is something, something went wrong. You mostly are paying the huge price for very, uh, let's say, arguable benefits. So because you have problems with class pass, problem with JBN versions, noise in locks, by the way, this is exactly today happened to me because I was analyzing some problem on a real application server because one of my customers is using application servers. And then there was a project which normally would have clean locks, but it was deployed to Java E. And then I had polluted locks with JBoss and everything like, and it was already like making a problem during the analysis. And uh, it's tough to test. This is, I would say the biggest problem of Java E compared to Spring because the Spring frame, frame of um, autos invested a lot to make tests easier, even though if by nature uh, doing tests with Spring context is uh, not that fun, it's, uh, it's, it's actually also now not a problem. In Java E still, we have an issue here. Like Archelian, whoever, I'm using that uh, because if I'm using Java E, I want to test it for real. And I'm using Archelian and this is not a, not a fun at all. It's very slow, that's for sure. And then you have configuration issues and JVM params here. So long time ago, we thought, oh, that's a cool thing. Let's make everything on Java JBoss or WebSphere. There was one way to describe configuration and our admins will read this configuration, everything will be fine, they will run that. But reality is that uh, our administrators, they hate DevOps, whatever you call them. They typically, even, okay, maybe they don't hate, but, but this is not the standard environment, doing stuff in configuration of JBoss, WebSphere, or whatever. They are Linux guys, or uh, some maybe some other systems. They they have their own configuration files. And for them, this is like, uh, if there is some problem with servers, now there is a problem because maybe you don't even have access to configuration and you rely on some guy that doesn't know this server because this is not his part of the world. And you ask him what is configured, how is something configured? So I would say, uh, this is what actually Josh Long is from Spring is saying for years, make jar not work, make jar not ear. Yeah, why well, don't just uh, deploy jars even though if there are size problems, you can solve them partially. Uh, but we have already containers, which are, let's say, more common, and let's say problems we can uh, partially reduce. I don't say that everything that mm, has <laughs> you have in JBoss, you directly replace with Docker. This is a more complex story, but at the end of the day, it's more or less similar way how you containerize application, that you put it into something and you define security, what's access to what. This is more or less the same story from the administration perspective. Uh, I, uh, I've forgotten the name, German name for that, blown egg pattern. There is something which I'm using when I'm, I have to use Java E or because of some reason. I put all my services, business logic, and tests of this logic into the separate package, like my logic. And this package has basically no association with Java E. Sometimes it really depends. It has access maybe to JDBC, like it's sometimes even to JPA uh, for some reason, because I maybe this is like old application uses JPA and I have to accept that. And then I have only a wrapper which does uh, JAX-RS. So it defines how uh, web services and I call this, inside this wrapper, I'm using this core. So, but this is just a very brief, this is just a shell. There is nothing really, no logic there. And I, I would say this appears to be a very productive pattern. Uh, I will tell you why, for instance, this looks like this, that for instance, you even, this is this JAX-RS service, like orders, you have uh, uh, JAX-RS annotation, show orders, but then you have order service from other package and you even put the, give them like dependency. Here is used dependency injection manually. Entity manager, which you actually get it from container because you have sometimes used, and then you call the real method. It's actually typically more complex, but this is this shows the way. What the benefits of that I've seen. This is actually, let's say, accidental. We, we one project, we started to do that, let's say partially accidentally, but it became very productive because for instance, now, 
your tests are free or Java E, and you can really, really test your logic very fast. Maybe even with real database, there are some like DB units or other, uh, or in-memory in -memory, uh, databases, and you can really test it fast uh, until the end and only the last layer, web services layer is not really tested or is briefly covered with one or two smoke tests and then you have it. This, this, this is how I really uh, work for Java e, with Java e, uh, for some time. If I have to, mostly I'm just avoiding doing uh, plain Java e, but it appears to be quite productive. And so <laughs> let's say my message would be, I, I will show you some of my message, but uh, one, one, one also funny thing, because I still remember how this was born. Java e was not a thing to create beans, not to solve dependency injection, especially. That was initially something like a better core bar. That's something from 90s. You, if you don't know it, don't get into it because you might get crazy. But nevertheless, this was this was something like we did microservices of 90s, let's say. Uh, it was to support remoting, so Java E. Uh, distributed transactions, that's a cool feature. You might now see that the problem because it really typically limits the performance, but this is the thing that Java E initially solved and that was like a core point of it. And it was to be resource friendly, like put many applications on one JVM to, uh, to not use too much RAM. That's what was Java E about. That wasn't about creating beans. Beans was just something you want, you needed to that, but it was really old Java, uh, Java E two beans. Uh, to solve these problems. That was like a tool, not the, not the thing. So it really now became crazy because I see new modern Java E applications, which are all about CDI beans, uh, composing, uh, run one application on a single server, nothing to do with a distributed transaction, nothing with remoting, nothing like that. So it's like total against original idea. So it's it somehow went crazy. But okay, my solution for you, because I've shown you a lot of bad things. Because I constantly see these bugs on productions and see this as a problem. I want you to know the problems so that you make less of those problems and, and you, let's say, make me useless. I won't be fixing those bugs because sooner or later I want to retire. Yeah. So you can use baby steps and make your life better. Not really dropping Java E or Spring. You don't have to do that. You can still use that, but for sure you need to drop application servers. Really, uh, at this moment, I don't really see a reason. Maybe, okay, historically, maybe it will cost you, so you don't have to do that instantly, but please do not start new projects and introduce new application servers. I really think this story is probably over. If you, even if you laugh for some reason, Java E, most of the servers right now support embedded mode, and it really uh, solves already a lot of problems. So, uh, make Java not work, this is cool. And by the way, Spring Boot is still good for a start. I don't say don't use it. But the step two, this is, let's say, I think we can all get to this step and this doesn't cost much and we can do that slowly. You don't, it's not, you know, it's not all or nothing. Just hold your beans. Think, does it have to be a really a bean? Or can I use simple constructor-based dependency injection and without container? Just for some modules, just create those modules without Spring. Try it. You don't have to try it on your big production. Try it on a smaller project. Check it. Check it for your own, for your for yourself. Yeah. Like maybe you like it, maybe don't. That's up to you. It's hard to judge if it's not real production. And by the way, I don't say if you drop. Uh, dependency injections and everything, you will uh, container based dependency. There will be not problems. There will be other problems, but uh, for me, uh, I would say easier to reason about, less magic. But okay, it's up to you. Please do not trust me. Do it for yourself. I, I will, I can, you can trust me that I did it. I'm doing that for years and I was satisfied with this method. So uh, you can use this blown egg pattern so like the shell is spring on a rest base maybe it's java e but inside this is a clean architecture just your code no dependencies so uh, no dependencies to frameworks then there is a harder part i would say 
for me, worse than Spring and Java is, and ACDA, whatever, is actually JPA. And I strongly suggest it if you are really, especially if you are struggling with JPA, try one of alternatives. JOQ, it's like our Swiss projects, really cool if you wanna use SQL. Query DSL is a little bit hmm, not perfectly up to date, but it still works. We have it on production. JDBI is more primitive. It's almost like uh, better JDBC. All of them work. And I would say for a long, uh, JPA is cool for, uh, I would say, if you want to prototype something. But going with that, with a serious team development for months, I already seen a lot of uh, problematic stories and really drop in efficiency. Uh, maybe you don't see that, but because it takes time to see that actually it costs a lot, this fancy JPA. And then it's top four, which is actually what I am following, but I don't say you should do it because it's hard. Going uh, functional programming and, uh, and uh, and uh, for instance, I call it, I have alternative talk where I say transaction is a monad. I can even show you that. So probably you are afraid of a M word monad, but that is transaction as a monad. It solves one of the problems uh, that you can easily, for instance, pass a transaction between classes and nest transaction easily with this flat map. So by the way, flat map and map is the thing as you have in optional. And this more or less you handle is like an optional. So this is like, because optional is as well a monad. And this is, for instance, the way I already have in one project. I'm quite satisfied with this. Uh, sadly, there is nothing, and there, now there is a problem. There is nothing really ready with this approach. Uh, like a framework that provides all of this for you. So that wasn't much code, but I had to write it on my own. So transaction as a function, which you pass Lambda, you have plenty of this implementation, even in Spring. But if you want to transaction as a monad, I don't know anything that really is uh, ready there. I'm working on some uh, open source project, which I not even name because it's uh, so immature that would be a shame to even, uh, how to say, advertise it. Sorry, it's I'm experimenting, so what I can tell you now. And there are more people that are experimenting and getting that farther, but it is future. This is nothing you can go like, this year on production. And I can even promise you any year you can go. I can tell you that people in Scala world are doing something and there, there were some alternatives for years, for instance. Uh, we can say that what is really cool, Spring and Java are really battle tested. And if you have a problem, that's maybe more important. A lot of this problem, actually there are solutions on Stack Overflow. Sometimes it's not easy to, if you don't know how the magic works, it's, it's hard to uh, know what to ask for. But this is this typical like performance problem or something, there will be a solution. It's not the case, for instance, I actually used some alternatives like Akka, Lagom, Lagom, mostly for fun, not really for, for productive use, but Akka for productive. There is now something in Scala world called Zio, which becomes more popular, but it's still not really mature. So we don't have that many <laughs> platforms that let's say, uh, safely, like, you know, no one was uh, uh, how to fired because of choosing uh, ZIO. <laughs> no, actually, no. So no one was fired maybe for choosing Spring. That's what we have right now. Uh, and uh, probably because of that, a lot of people is are using that, yeah? So uh, one thing is that people say, because it's easy if you have Java developers, they will know Spring or Java E. And I say on a shallow level without the understanding of magic and with getting into pitfalls, yes, but I'm actually shocked how badly people understand how it works and what kind of crazy people things pay people do when they are faced with problems. This is really insane sometimes, really like putting this random annotation. So be careful with that, that everyone knows Spring. Everyone knows Spring very shallow and this is actually a very complex thing. So, uh, and what I said, this was my own presentation. We can still benefit from Java E and Spring to some extent, I would say more with Spring, but with Java E, let's say we can still just use it uh, while minimizing use of bins. And in my opinion, this is very helpful uh, on almost any scale. There are more, more talks about this case. Again, annotation by Adam Varsky, Tom Gabel slaying sacred cows. Uh, okay. Uh, interesting is, okay, this Uncle Bob uh, dependency injection uh, to, uh, block. And uh, by the way, Spring is also doing, uh, Spring stuff is doing crazy stuff into getting things, uh, stuff farther, like especially for Kotlin. So they have interesting uh, project called Kofu, 
No, so it was, it was like first created Spring Fu. It's I would say it is, is a Spring Boot of the next generation. And although I am not fully satisfied how it is done because it still uses beans inside, but it looks better. And maybe the code created with that in the future will be better. So I, I have still hope in Spring, guys. I don't know what about Java E here. And by the way, you've probably noticed that I have nothing good to say about CDI. Sorry for that. I, that's partially my fault. I tried, but I failed. And that's it. That's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Yelik. That was a lot of information in a very short time. I'm very lucky that I'm recording this so I can replay it and hear it again. Um, so we have uh, still a few questions here. Uh, one question is uh, what uh, to use instead of secured roles allowed when using spring security or not using mm -hmm. spring security at all oh uh, okay that's the that's the question i am not really prepared because uh for because of the company i'm mostly now working for last two years i don't see this problem now uh, basically i'm using rest services uh, which are uh, behind and I don't really play with that, so I'm not prepared for that. I uh, I think you can uh, you can basically glue. Uh, I would do it this way that I would glue the Spring security exactly with such kind of a function that accepts function on Lambda. But I don't have. I'm almost sure in my code base any example of that. Yeah, I have uh, in my one of my project on a GitHub something done without Spring security at all. So I am just checking uh, authorization headers and checking uh, in database. This is actually not very complex code, but I would say if you do, are doing real security, for instance, you are, if you want to use a cross-site request forgery, then you probably want to rely on Spring. And then you might think that but you you might think about again this uh, blown egg pattern, but I don't I don't have ready uh, code in mind. Yeah, I would try it this way. But I'm I, I I would say think about not using annotation, just using Spring uh, security context and getting it uh, in a in a web uh, layer and then passing it. Yeah, right. because that is let's say m for me more secure to tests and to reason. Next question. What do you tell managers saying that frameworks lets you save a dozen developers? <laughs> OK. Uh, it's like uh, I don't really, I maybe I uh, don't have this kind of managers, but I have arguments mostly with architects, uh, a different level of architects. OK, I would say I don't have a good answer for you because you know my, I have a beard. Uh, and people know that I'm actually in almost every company solving these problems and I actually start with solving problems. So they instantly see that I am able to solve the problems that developers are struggling with. Uh, so I have some trust that I know that I'm talking about. But if you are, I know this because that was me in the past, actually, when I was proposing Java E. <laughs> I still remember I had to fight for it because if you don't have beard, you are young, even if you are right and you are sure about that, it's hard to convince other people. So sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, what I do recommend mm, is try on a, your own project, try on a small scale and by the way, use any possibility in company uh, to do something, for instance, on hackathon, on some trainings to do something in a different way. Even if you don't wanna, for instance, if you don't like what I presented, if you say, yeah, this is not really true, but learning something new is never bad. So, and I've seen actually the bigger company, the bigger couple, you have the more opportunities you actually have to train something even during your work time, because uh, those companies typically know that this is not wasted time. Yeah, trainings and, but, but don't just do 23rd application in a spring boot because you already know it, <laughs> what's, the, what's the point? Try something different, yeah? And then, then you will see for yourself, yeah? And then, and by the way, again, if, you, if it's absolutely new to you, this thing, try, as I said, on a baby steps, so don't go full production with new project with this approach. Try on one module and like this. This is my, my approach, that's how I started it, yeah? 
Another question. Is there a talk about the transaction is a monad topic? Can you post a link for the talk? <laughs> there will be. I think I I think I presented it already, but I don't I don't remember any any recording and might be that I presented it uh, at, on uh, in Polish. I just want to present it. I submitted it recently uh to some conferences uh, which are now opening online but we'll see i think uh, i just uh, scanned actually and they, i i was submitting this topic and i think once i was uh, doing that but that was in polish unfortunately so this year will be but if you look in google transaction is a monad you will find solutions in java actually so that's not a so not a talk but examples small examples you will find that's mm -hmm. that's what i found I actually I even remember that one of those uh uh, implementations I was using, I was using to play, and then I realized, oh, this is actually cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then I get my own implementation, which was uh, specific for a company mm -hmm. and for a, for a stack companies using. Okay, one more question: uh, Do you have tips on how to debug the magic parts of Spring JPA or other mm -hmm. frameworks? For example, I always struggle what to do when I step into runtime generated bytecode that cannot be debugged step by step with available code in the IDE. Hmm. I am doing it from some time to time, more often than I would like, but I don't really have any specific tips. Uh, I would say, during, so during the years, I became familiar with Spring code. So I always have Spring sources, and I try to basically have the Spring sources of the Spring version I'm using. Uh, and I'm just debugging Spring with just sources, not the compiling them. And that's about basically IntelliJ does it for you. And I'm uh, just by reading sources, I know a couple of places where I put breakpoints. Yeah, but I, I, I can tell you breakpoints, for instance, when you want to debug transactional, because there are a couple of strange places, like during the initialization of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Spring. But yeah, there are more such things, and it is like depends what you are debugging. I don't have any, I would say, magic hammer, golden hammer for that. Just get used to the Spring sources. By the way, those are really good quality sources with a documentation and with a quite readable, which I cannot, for instance, say about some of the Java EE servers, which are horrible uh, in the code. And uh, even I have nightmares looking at them, yeah? <laughs> the compiled code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And uh, there was one comment that application servers are not equal to Java EE. Yes, okay, that's maybe uh, uh, for me, like, yes, Java is a broader specification. We have all these things, but for me, I was maybe mostly attacking application server and use of application server. When it comes to Java E, we don't only have EJB, we don't only have JTA, we have tons of, uh, which have Java, Java JAXRS and all other st stuff like um, message driven beans, J uh, JMS. I would say, uh, uh, for me, usage of that now I see really dropped. Most of those, uh, I'm not sure if those are that useful as in the past, like for instance, JMS without distribute, without two-phase commits, which <laughs> uh, does it really bring that much value compared to alternatives? Yeah, that's, that's the point. I cannot answer you right now. I haven't used JMS uh, for some time. Okay, I'm using that, but mostly because I have to and some old applications, but not that I, Use wanted to use it so, but for me, like uh, okay, for me, it is associated, and I mostly uh, mean about yeah, calling Java e stuff inside of a uh, application container which might be embedded. Yeah, and uh, Bastian mentioned that there was announced in April the GraalVM native image compilation, uh, mm -hmm. with Spring. Uh, but I think it's uh, enough. Uh, stuff for a secret topic mm -hmm. uh, for a secret talk yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. by the way image so i actually i'm surprised how good spring actually works with all of this because i always expected because for instance exactly application servers vendors of java e have problems with that typically that's i haven't even seen any of that working <laughs> with native image 
Um, but maybe I haven't looked uh, well, but uh, Spring is constantly doing something. So they actually together working with Graal team to make it. Uh, but for me, for instance, more interesting is how to run efficiently Scala, let's say frameworks in that, which is also, by the way, not that easy. So yeah, but this is a separate talk, exactly. Okay, so we are done. No more questions. It was a very long talk with all the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Jarek, for the time, for preparing everything and for uh, for the talk itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would like to mention, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the small bell to get a notification when we publish uh, this talk later. And we have a lot of more talks in the pipeline so if you take a look at our website, we have about uh, six or seven more talks. Uh, but be careful, one of them is a talk in the real world where you have to go to and sit down and watch with your real eyes. It's uh, our first new real talk after the corona situation and it will take place in Basel in the Markthalle uh, mid of June. All the other talks are online talks. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, please wait a little bit uh, after I end the webinar. You will be forwarded to the um, feedback form. Please fill out the feedback form. It's very important information for the Java user group, for the speaker, for Jarek. And uh, after we have filled out the feedback form, you can uh, fill out a second form with your email address to win an IntelliJ IDEA license. Thank you very much. Enjoy the evening and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.